My name is Steve Howell. I'm pleased to welcome you to this forum on behalf of the Vancouver Island Criminal Justice Association. We're happy to host the event tonight with financial assistance from the Law Foundation of British Columbia. Our president, Bill Foster, is going to talk to you a little later in the evening. Uh, but I just want to mention now that the Vancouver Island Criminal Justice Association is an affiliate with the Canadian Criminal Justice Association and the British Columbia Criminal Justice Association. Uh, we're a very happy uh, and convivial band of uh, legal types, corrections type, police type, um, youth justice types, victim services types, uh, and advocates and um, fellow travelers. And so you're very welcome to join us if you like. We meet monthly and we have forums like this about quarterly. Uh, there's information on the tables outside there if you'd like to consider joining our fine organization. We'd love to have you along. Thank you very much for that, uh, for that, Steve, Stephen. It's an extremely important issue. Uh, this relationship uh, between uh, criminal justice, within the criminal justice system, between the prosecution, the prosecutorial service, uh, and the police is one that's been under constant review and sometimes pressure in British Columbia and other jurisdictions. Um, it's a very tricky relationship, and it's well, it, it may seem simple on the on the outside when you actually get into the mechanics and the working of the investigatory process, which is a police process, and an evidentiary process, which is a court process, and the prosecutorial <coughs> process, uh, you can sometimes, sometimes get different standards of proof, of burdens of proof, and you can get some uh, dissonance between those two critically important uh, branches of the criminal justice system. Um, it's it's really tough to be a public uh, inquiry commissioner or chair uh, a commission. Um, and I think Jeff has caught exactly the right note because apart from the substantive recommendations, <coughs> uh, what it's all dependent on, including the trust uh, that the public will put in the results and the recommendations and the system itself uh, will put in the recommendations, uh, you have to have at least three uh, imperatives. One, that the person be independent, seen and respected as independent. It requires that that commissioner or, or inquiry chair um, must have access to all information. Um, and finally, it has to report publicly. David will speak first in alphabetical order, then uh, Robert, and then Jeff will follow up, responding somewhat to their comments, uh, but also speaking more generally about his report. To begin with, if I can ask David to uh, start off our remarks. Thank you. Hey, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hello. We come from different tribes. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. Um, uh, our organization, the BC Civil Liberties Association, has a certain perspective about how we got where we are in the criminal justice system today, and that is that we are in a crisis. Um, and not just a small crisis, but a really big one. Um, and, uh, and I'll give you uh, some of those uh, uh, indicators that we look to, red flags about the crisis in the criminal justice system um, shortly. Um, but I want to start with a bit of a story about how uh, we think we got here. So in 2001, uh, the government uh, set as an imperative uh, cutting uh, government costs. And one of the departments or systems that was looked at for targets of cost cutting was the criminal justice system. Um, the uh, criminal lawyers, um, as uh, those in government said, could have easily been predicted, uh, and lawyers generally got together and said, please don't cut uh, the criminal justice system, you're going to end up with a crisis. There's going to be big problems if you have cuts on the kind of order that you're talking about. Uh, you're going to be facing a crisis. Uh, and they got together, they were so concerned that they got together in the Law Society of BC, and they passed a motion of non-confidence in the then Attorney General, who was uh, the face of the cuts that the government was putting forward at the time. They said, we don't have confidence that you're going to protect the criminal justice system, you're going to protect the process. And in fact, uh, uh, we think you're on the completely wrong track. So, um, from 2001 to 2008, I have some statistics here for you. Um, uh, there was a 42% cut to administrative staff and security for courtrooms. Uh, the budget for corrections was cut 29%. Um, the number of full-time provincial court uh, judges uh, from 2008 to 2012 dropped from 141 
up to 121, plus 20 judges. Um, at that time, there was actually, uh, up to 2008, there was actually an increase in the number of cases the criminal justice system was dealing with. Uh, they had 14% more uh, cases in 2008 than in 2001, and there were 16% more people in prison. Funding for legal aid was cut 36%. Uh, now 36% less than it was in 2001. Legal aid is what funds defense lawyers to come to represent people who otherwise can't afford lawyers who are facing a loss of their liberty and uh, people who are facing loss of their children to ministry of family and children and so on. So what, what are the, uh, we say, inevitable results of cuts on the order of 30 to 40% for the criminal justice system? Every aspect, prisons, legal aid, judges, administration. Um, delays before trial are up 28%. In just six years. Um, BC's prisons have ratios of uh, up to 60 prisoners for one guard in some institutions. It used to be 20 to 1. Um, from 2004 to 2011, 51% of deaths in prisons were from unnatural causes, drug overdoses, murders, um, uh, accidental overdose, uh, suicide. Uh, only 35% of community programming for people who are on parole is actually completed. Uh, because there, there's a shortage of probation officers. And uh, more than half, more than half of the people who are in prison right now in BC have not been found guilty of anything. They are waiting for a trial. Um, and so, in another way, a fewer than half have been found guilty in sentence. So in our mind, um, when you have people who are literally dying in jail, uh, when you have guards who are asked to guard 60 prisoners and their safety is at risk, when you have more than half of the people in jail not found guilty of any offense who are simply waiting for trial, this doesn't even get into something called ASCOB applications, which are applications made by criminal defense lawyers to say, this trial has taken too long, and I want the charges to be dismissed because it's unfair to the defendant if we continue. And these are the kinds of applications that really jeopardize public trust in the system. We say that this is, this is the inevitable result of, of cutting huge resources from the criminal justice system. And so, when, uh, when we presented to Mr. Cowper, uh, we presented him with this report. Some of you I see grabbed it up front. It was called Justice Denied. It's got these statistics. It's got the footnotes, the Statistics Canada, and BC stats uh, about where we got these numbers from. We didn't make them up. Uh, this is the reality of our criminal justice system right now. We presented this uh, report to Mr. Cowper. We said, this is the problem. Uh, the government would like to tell you that this is about uh, lawyers being obstinate, not getting with modern times and the Crime rate is down, so therefore we should have, uh, you know, we should have uh, more efficiencies in the criminal justice system. There are fewer cases, uh, and so on. Uh, and and really, the only reduction in cases uh, that we've seen has come from something called uh, a, a new program that deals with drunk driving to to stream drunk drivers out of the criminal justice system into an administrative process. So the way it works is this: you go to a bar. You have a bunch of drinks, you get pulled over at the side of the road by a police officer. The police officer says, uh, please blow, in, blow into this breathalyzer, and you blow over 0.08. Previously, you would have gone into provincial court, and you would have been charged criminally, and you would have had a trial, and these kind of things. You have been sentenced to jail, fined, lost your license, and so on. Now, uh, the officer gives you uh, an administrative notice that on the spot, you lose your license, there are thousands of dollars in fines, uh, and uh, lose your license for periods of months, uh, and uh, the consequence of that is that for many people, they lose their jobs, they lose their, lose their livelihoods, and there are serious questions, uh, as there have been in many drug driving cases where many people have been found not guilty, um, about uh, the decisions made at the side of the road sometimes by police officers. But if you have a concern that you didn't blow over 0.08, that there was some kind of issue at the side of the road, the only appeal that you could make was to uh, an official that had no independence of government. This was someone who was appointed by government, uh, could be fired at any time, uh, had no, uh, had none of the protections that judges have. And the court looked at the system and said, this is unconstitutional. You can't put the kind of penalties on people that you're putting on people with this regime, and then have the only appeal be to someone who has no independence of government, from government. And so, while it may be um, that this program removed a lot of caseloads from the provincial court, uh, it did so at the expense of constitutional rights. And that is exactly the concern the BC Civil Liberties Association has is that if we're going to fix the criminal justice system, that we cannot do it at the expense of people's rights to due process, the rights to have their case heard in front of an independent decision maker, uh, and so on. And I know Mr. Cowper shares those values, but um, 
we had concern that this program was held up in the report as an example of something positive, when in fact it is exactly what we're concerned about in terms of potential reforms to the criminal justice system. So, <coughs> we must be blunt enough to say to the government, it's not good enough to apply restraint to the centerpiece of our social organization, that is the administration of justice. It's not good enough. And we must be smarter about what we're doing with people who are in conflict with the law. Same with our prisons. Our prisons are overcrowded. Two inmates in a cell designed for one is common. Units which were designed for 18 or 20 with 30 or 35 individuals. What is that? What is that? That's a hothouse of of harm. Individuals with little place to go, they can't even get privacy, stuck together. What kind of a product would you expect to come out of that prison? What kind of a product would you expect? It, the individual's got to come out worse than when he or she went in. I have dealt with young clients who may have to have been in prison because of serious charge or ineligibility for release for some reason or other, who after a period of time in prison clearly demonstrate a whole different outlook on the world. They become socialized in the prison. While you're spending, or some of you are spending a term at Camosun College, they're spending a term there coming out worse. So shouldn't we, if we have any sense of sophistication, say we should be very, very careful about the number of people that we place in prisons. But we're living in a tough era, as somebody else has commented. We have a government that's responsible for the criminal law in Canada, in Ottawa, that spends money putting ads on television, causing us to think about celebrating the War of 1812 while the 30th anniversary of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms passes without notice. Now that's a problem, because it's a matter of attitude. It's the same government that's introducing minimum sentences. Now what are minimum sentences going to do when they're in full effect for more offenses? They're going to fill those prisons with even more individuals, many of whom ought not to be there. And remember, it's the government that, in Ottawa that creates the criminal law. It also has a role in prosecutions, particularly what so-called federal offenses. Drug offenses in Canada are usually prosecuted by a federal agency. The bottom line about drug offenses is there's no limit to the number of charges you could lay. Because of the use of drugs for all the reasons that drugs are used, you could run an undercover operation every week in every city and have dozens of people to charge. Is it sensible? Is that a sensible way to deal with drugs? and fill our prisons with drugs, and have those individuals come out the back end, unemployed and unemployable. Who's going to say no? It has to be us who says no. We have to say no. That this just isn't smart enough, because as somebody else said recently, the individuals coming out of the prisons are our neighbors, and will be our neighbors. So. There, there are great matters of principle at stake here. And one of the concerns I have is that the, the so-called problems with the administration of justice are just a matter of money and management and, and uh, more sophisticated dealing with volume and so on and so forth. It's much more than that. The administration of justice is right at the core of a community. It gives us a sense of the rule of law and justice and fairness. So we have to we have to lift up our eyes above the numbers and recognize the principles again. Now, Mr. Eady has already mentioned a concern about the parallel justice system introduced for impaired driving. That sort of thing is driven by the notion of reducing the caseload. And there's good reason, as I've already argued, to be restrained in the use of the criminal law. 
and many individuals who are caught up in impaired driving circumstances ought not to be prosecuted under the criminal law. It is an appropriate thing for the motor vehicle law. However, it's a different thing when you start giving non-judges, police officers and administrative hearing officers, the right to impose punishments, fines, and disqualifications, and use the coercive power of the state. That should be reserved for a courtroom where there are rights and privileges and long-standing practice designed to avoid trampling on individuals' rights. So we've gone too far, but what I'm asking you is, who's speaking up? Where is the Attorney General or the Deputy Attorney General or the Minister of Justice saying, hey, wait a minute, this is not consistent with our fundamental values of punishing people by roadside action engaged by the police and confirmed by some hearing officer in the bureaucracy. Who's speaking up and saying that? Is anybody saying that in the councils of government? Does nobody say we go to charter rights and freedoms? And these things are important? Somebody has to say it. Thank you. start really by saying that I think we live in incredibly exciting times in the justice system. Uh, and I'm going to deal with both the things which, are, which I hold in common with David and Robert and some things which we perhaps disagree on. Let me just start with why I think they're exciting. First of all, um, what we're seeing in the justice system right now is the convergence of disciplines from a variety of different approaches, which hold the prospect of, I think, vastly improving the outcomes of the justice system. They, they hold the prospect of vastly improving the results for offenders, vastly improving the experience of victims, vastly, experience, vastly improving the experience of the public in relation to their view of how the justice system works. So I think it's actually uh, amazing that we're at a time when people are looking at the justice system and saying, well, what happens if we apply a modern systems approach to it? And what happens if we apply modern information systems. It's sure, applied everywhere else. What happens if, for example, I like Robert's phrase, uh, we have to look above the numbers. Well, I also say you have to look below the numbers. What do the numbers tell you about what's actually happening? So, for example, um, I'm on the board of Street to Home Foundation, and we started studying longitudinally the backgrounds for people who are chronically homeless. For the first time, as far as I know, anywhere, somebody said, well, what's been the pattern of your injuries? And we found out that 40 to 60 percent of the people who are chronically homeless had a history of brain injury. Well, nobody had, had before correlated brain injury and chronic homelessness. Okay? People had correlated <coughs> mental illness, but that opened a whole area of discussion about what these people may need in order to uh, be better integrated into the community and be rescued from being street homelessness. And that example I could multiply dozens of times where Time after time after time, people are asking more searching questions, coming up with better numbers, and then the numbers disclose things that are happening underneath. And, and then they raise more productive questions that I think offer a lot of solutions. Um, and, and I'm going to come to this in a moment. But the other thing that I, I uh, am very excited about is the development of information systems around not just the numbers, but about events have opened the portals to the justice system in a way that is stunning. It is unbelievable. I watched the Truscott appeal that took place a generation after his conviction. As everybody knows, Stephen Truscott, he was convicted as a teenager of killing a younger girl. And um, he served out his entire term. And gradually, he had an entire reference in the Supreme Court of Canada. His conviction was upheld. And then a generation later, another reference to the Ontario Court of Appeal was held. Well, the big difference between the Supreme Court of Canada reference and the Ontario Court of Appeal references, the Supreme Court of Canada reference, which took place about 1970, I think, um, was basically private, right? There were a bunch of people who were watching it. The Ontario Court of Appeal reference, you could watch the entire thing on video. It was, it was, it was riveting. Um, one of the things that was featured in that case was that the original pathologist had taken 
exa uh, examples of the insects that were found on the dead girl's body. Well, at the time, nobody knew what that meant. Like, there was no such thing as forensic entomology. They didn't, they didn't time the death of a body, uh, death of a person, by reason of entomological remains. But they, for some reason, had captured these, put them in formalin, and then a generation later, a scientist was able to show up and say, look, forget the doubt about it. I can tell you the time of death is completely inconsistent with his conviction, inconsistent with the suspicion that he might have done it. And so it was a generation later, but as a result largely of that forensic development, his innocence was, was, uh, was firmly proven. There's a huge amount of innovation going on right now. And, and I've tried to be excited about that in the report. So if you're not excited, I'll try to make you excited right now. So the, basically what's happening, I think, and it's because of the confluence of both need, because the actors in the justice system have been told by government, you're not getting more money. And so they've got to try to figure out how do they serve their constituencies without more money. There's no doubt that's a combination of a challenge, but also an opportunity. So they've been looking at other ways of service. They've been looking at innovation. And we're learning that some things work, some things don't work. So let me talk about uh, David and Robert for a bit. So uh, for, the mo for the most part, I think, with respect to David's comments, um, I do think a couple of things. First of all, um, I was on the board of the Legal Aid Society from 1997 to 2002. I then got fired by the Liberals, and then I got reappointed, and I served another two terms. So I served in the 90s and in the 2000s. And I was on the Walk for Justice Committee. I was uh, in the 90s, right? And we suffered a series of rolling cutbacks to legal aid in the 90s under one government. And then the new government came in, and we thought, well, we couldn't possibly suffer any more cutbacks. And of course, we suffered further cutbacks, most critically, in my view, to family and civil and poverty legal aid. Because criminal legal aid, largely constitutionally driven, was, did not suffer the same kind of cutbacks as other forms of legal aid. My point around that is that I don't think, with respect, that the system's going to get more money until we more clearly deserve it. Okay? And I would second and third and, and clap for speeches about how we need more money. But I will say that on any objective analysis, there are lots of places we can do far, far better. And I'm convinced that if we do better, that our claim on the social license to have a broader share of the Treasury will be far better. And I'll give you a, a short example of that from my own experience. So we lost all of the family we delayed. It didn't go from you know, 100 down to 40. We lost every penny of family we delayed in the cutbacks in 2002. Now, many provinces have no family legal aid, and so on a policy basis, you could say, well, you know, we, we, we weren't that worse off than other provinces, even though we've long held a family legal aid tariff in British Columbia. And we had, the previous year, spent roughly $25 million on family trials. Now, the board and the staff of legal aid said, well, we have no money. What can we do for our family clients? And they developed a limited time advisory service that basically funded advice and not trials for family clients. And we didn't do it because that's what we wanted to do. It's because the only money we could get from the Law Foundation was going to be restricted to that kind of very limited service. Well, what we found, much to our surprise, was that the customer feedbacks from that service were far, far more positive than our previous service. We didn't have clients who went, you know, I just went through a six-week custody trial that you funded, thank you very much, and my family's completely destroyed. We ended up having many, many people come back and say, because my lawyer advised me how to negotiate a settlement with my husband or my ex-husband, I then found myself better able to negotiate other issues with him. And so what we found, and then, surprise, surprise, law foundation gave us more money. The attorney phoned up and said, could I come to the next ribbon cutting ceremony for family legal aid. We said, well, unfortunately, you're not paying any money, so you haven't got a seat. And he said, well, actually, I'd like to reconsider that. And I don't know what the budget is now, but it's seven or eight million or six to eight million. In family legal aid, it's not 25 million, but I believe last year, the last numbers I looked at, we were actually providing legal advisory services to more women, 98% of women, more women than we did before, because we were limited before because of the cost per client. So, the model that I would urge upon all of us is, is, is to get better at what we do, to then be able to show the public that we're really effective at what we do, and I think ultimately politicians will follow. So 
let me uh, let me say a, a couple of things. So, so a lot of what David said, I agree with. Let me give a couple of, of, of points of uh, contrast a little bit, um, because I agree there's a crisis, and I've said that in my report. I think the crisis is whether the public thinks that the court-based system can ever work. Okay? I mean, I, and I agree with the comments that Robert made that the court-based system we have here is one of the very best in the world. But if you wander the highways and byways of this province, that's not what people think. And their concerns are not based entirely on fantasy. Okay, and I'll come back and talk about timeliness. Everybody in the system, except perhaps Robert and a few other people, think it takes too long. You think it's too slow. If you wander around courthouse, you talk to average people, they go, this is the fifth time I've been here. Nothing's happened. You walk into a courtroom, nothing seems to be happening. You have these multiple appearances. You have adjournments without any reason. You have cases which are minor, which drag on for a year or two years and then get stayed. The public looks at that and goes, well, second, that's not the symptoms of a well-functioning system. It's who's in charge of this system? And whoever it is, either should get fired or they should get some, some, some uh, different kind of uh, weedies. <laughs> Unfortunately, we often hear, usually in the public discourse in Parliament and elsewhere, including our local media, talk about what the public thinks of the administration of justice. And you know the theme. You can hear it every week. Somebody is saying the administration of justice or the justice system in Canada is a joke. Or that it doesn't care anything about victims, it only cares about the accused. Or that the sentences are ridiculously low. That's the constant drip, drip, drip of the public discourse about the criminal <coughs> justice system. And I blame, in part, the media for giving prominence to what essentially are ignorant remarks. Because anyone who spends any time comparing the administration of justice in BC and Canada and elsewhere in the world realizes that we probably have the very best justice system in the world. It's based on principle. We have an independent judiciary. We have a respected appeal process. It's not perfect, but it's about as good as it gets in human affairs. And it's very disappointing to never hear <coughs> the Prime Minister or the Minister of Justice or the Attorney General or the Premier or other opinion leaders who should know better defending the justice system in the way that it ought to be defended. And if it's not defended, then corrosive criticism undermines it. It undermines the administration of justice. And it's simply not true. And while there are problems with some cases, they are a small percentage of the cases. Thousands of cases are dealt with every year in Canada in an entirely satisfactory way. And the last thing we should be doing is trying to emphasize spending less money and having more speed in the administration of justice. It's the last thing we should be doing.